Most people think the X-Men got their start on film in the year 2000. But in actuality, they got their start a few years earlier, back in 1996, with a made-for-TV movie titled Generation X. No, this isn't a fever dream. No, this isn't a bad, bad type of movie. And yes, this is real. This is the X-Men movie that time forgot. Generation X really just goes to show you that sometimes, a first is the worst. We're about to take a look at a movie so bad it will make X-Men Origins Wolverine look like Days of Future Past. I'm talking about a movie that hardly even gets brought up anymore. But to be fair, it was hardly ever brought up shortly after it was created. This is something so hated that it's actually never been remastered or made its way to DVD. VHS copies do, however, exist. Feel free to dig out that old VCR you keep in the garage for some reason and get ready. If I had to sum up this movie real quick for you, I, I think I would have to do it with this scene. As you may have already suspected, yes, this made-for-TV movie was a pitch for a series that never got picked up, as usually is the case. However, it's not the type of series you may think, as this was dreamed up as a series of made-for-TV movies starring this cast. While Generation X is certainly no X2, it is an important piece of X-Men history. And this piece of history is chock full of bizarre but true facts, containing elements from past and future iterations of the franchise, borrowing a character from the animated X-Men series, and a location from the live-action X-Men movies. Seriously as Jeremy Ratchford reprises his role of Banshee from X-Men the Animated Series. Very few actors get to play the part in person after they've lended their voice to a cartoon, especially back then at this point in time. So that's kind of a relatively big get for an X-Men project. Being that this is an X-Men movie, you could probably imagine that a decent amount of it takes place at Charles Xavier's School for the Gifted. But I'm here to tell you that that school also looks like exactly what you're imagining, as it was filmed at the same location that has been used countless times in the X-Men movies over the last 20 years, from the original trilogy to the Deadpool films. A side note, this location is also no stranger to superheroes past this IP either as it's also been used as the Luther Mansion from Smallville and the Queen's Mansion from Arrow. Everything about this movie is so familiar, and yet, uh, somehow I'm a total stranger to all of it. It vaguely feels like the X-Men I know, but I don't know these X-Men. There's a lot to get into about this one. First and foremost, while it does seem like those creating it had a massive amount of passion for the project, this was a relatively low budget. A fact made obvious by your eyes. It's so low budget, however, that certain characters from the comics were completely unusable, as the studio didn't have the money to make effects required for heroes and villains. As a matter of fact, in order to beef up their lacking roster, they had to create and add two new mutants to the team, those being Buff and Refrax. Buff is a shy girl who is, you guessed it, super strong. What gave it away? Was it the naming convention? And Refrax, well, he's a little more interesting. He's allegedly a replacement for the character Chamber, a character who couldn't appear due to the limitations of special effects in general at the time, as in the comics, that character is depicted as having the lower half of his face looking like Ghost Rider's forehead. Chamber is a mutant who bursts sonic-based beams from his chest, not unlike Havoc. So they replace this character with a mutant who shoots laser beams from his eyes, but keeps them covered up with visors, not unlike Cyclops. Actually, no, exactly like Cyclops. Except where Cyclops was a likable leader, Refrax is the worst person you've never met. However, there was such faith in these new characters that for a brief point in time, there were plans on introducing them into the comics, should this series get picked up. But thankfully it wasn't, and they weren't. Likewise, the movie's main antagonist is also an all-original character made for the should-be series, which confuses me, as the X-Men have quite the rogues gallery to choose from. Look, when they develop a new villain for the Punisher, that makes sense to me. That guy doesn't have a rogues gallery, he has a hit list. So you constantly have to make up new villains for him because he's getting rid of everyone he comes in contact with. What could and should be a lifelong nemesis will end up being a 22-page story arc. For the most part, the man is without an archenemy because all of his enemies 
just become targets. But the X-Men? They have plenty of enemies to choose from. So to just go and make one up, I don't know, it just it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. Which falls in line with a lot of this movie, actually. The villain of this movie feels very indicative of the times. As he comes across like, we have Jim Carrey at home. His mannerisms, his voice. As a matter of fact, given the character's evil scheme of entering thoughts, or, well, in this case, dreams in order to obtain information, and the device that he wears around his head, this feels straight out of Batman Forever. Everything he does feels very on brand for an unproduced mask sequel, but feels very out of place in an X-Men film. Overall, if I'm being honest, I don't hate it. I hate that it takes place here, because this feels like the wrong environment for that type of performance. He doesn't really seem to connect with the rest of the movie. He's too over the top, while everything else is very subdued and casual. On one hand, it's good that he calls attention to himself, because it's good that something in this pilot is actually drawing attention. But on the other hand, this man chews so much scenery that I'm surprised the third act of the movie didn't have cardboard boxes in the place of walls and furniture. While I find him fun, to a point, this character and this script just feel like a bad combination. Although the overacting does make sense to me now, as after doing a little bit of research, I realized this man not only acted as the White Knight in the Alice series that I and nobody else watched back in 2009, but much more importantly was Max Headroom. Yeah, that checks out. Like the guy, like the part, don't like the place he played the part. Emma Frost is just as cold as her last name implies. Most of her screen time is spent being mean in silly outfits. And look, I get it. She wears something similar in the comics, but that's when she's on actual missions. I don't think her hero attire should just be her casual wear. It's a little different for Banshee, who just looks like he's auditioning for the next Resident Evil game. Emma's kinda awful in this one. She's much more strict than Banshee, and her students are afraid of her. Not just because of her powerful psychic abilities, but also because of the constant cold shoulder she gives to everybody. There are some characters in this that I struggle to find ways of describing, because while most, if not all, aren't fleshed out, some are hardly even sketched. Nonetheless, I'll try. You have Skin, whose skin stretches, which seems like a fun, harmless power, until you realize how much pain it puts him in, which makes you not even want to see it. If this was a way of saving costs on, on special effects, smart call, because I never want to see this mutant use his power again. Outside of his abilities, we learn that he's smart. Except when he isn't. A genius at technology, but an idiot when it comes to falling for bad guy plans. M is really just there. That's more than anyone could say for her. Out of everyone, she gets the least amount of screen time and has the least amount of importance. There's just nothing of note to say about this character. As a matter of fact, mentioning that she's present might even somehow be too much. There are other complaints I have about a lot of these characters, as most feel so far removed from the actual characters that they're based on, that they just might as well be something else. I'm serious, it would take very minimal work reworking this movie into something else entirely. It would almost be effortless. I'm gonna be honest, it just feels really weird and really wrong seeing a white jubilee. I'm not trying to call the PC police on this one, but it just doesn't feel like the character that I'm used to. Not that the actress is doing wrong by the character, but whoever was casting either didn't know much about the character that they were casting, or far more likely, they just didn't care. Even putting her ethnicity aside, there is nothing aside from her powers and a yellow jacket to even suggest that she's the same character, which is like April O'Neil levels of character characterization. I do like what the actress did, but it's next to impossible for me to see this as being the same character. Similarly, you have Mondo, who's not Samoan like the character from the comics, though this bothered me less only because I'm less familiar with that particular character. But this guy's just a jerk. I'm not saying that insultingly, I'm saying that that's kind of how this movie sets up characters. They're all one-note characters that you could describe with one word. He is Jerk. Jerk is friends with Perv. Perv likes Strong Girl. That's just kind of how these archetypes work. They're basic blueprints of characters that are one-note at best. Even when a character gets growth, it doesn't play out fluidly, it just feels rushed. The plot is kind of hard to describe. There's a lot happening, but a lot of it doesn't matter. But what it comes down to is our main villain. 
He's a creepy dude who used to operate on mutants in an effort to develop a dream machine that will grant him access into the dream dimension. And while that does sound laughable, that's actually almost something out of Marvel Comics, believe it or not. He's essentially trying to replicate Frost's powers for himself because he's a power-hungry madman. So he puts himself in the dream dimension by using a device so that he can reign all-powerful. But then he gets stuck there by accident because of Skin, and then Skin has to get him out of that dimension and back to the real world. So then the bad guy decides to take the mutant X gene from Skin, and the team has to go save him. Did you get any of that? That's, that's the plot. That, that, that is the plot. Don't even get me started on the ending, because I, I, I do not know how to describe it. They confront him in real life, but also in the dream dimension, and then a lot of stuff happens, and powers are used, people fight, and then the team wins by sending him to the bottom of a mental abyss, and leaving him in the dream dimension. Did you get that? Because I didn't. There are things I genuinely like about this movie. They put an importance on important issues, like showcasing the team's trainings, having them grow as a group, as people, and as future heroes. I don't love the way all these scenes were done, but I like that it played a part here. They showed the registration and clear attempted restriction of mutants, and how societally they're treated as lesser than. I think this is another one of those adaptations where the allegories are kinda right on the nose. Which I don't hate, but I would appreciate a little more subtlety. Like, on TV, them announcing that the AIDS epidemic could have been avoided if they would have gotten rid of all the mutants? Remember how I said there were things I liked about this movie? I meant it. I meant all those things. Much more important is there is a lot I loathe about this movie. If you think what I've showed you up until this point has been bad, brother, you ain't seen the half of it. Obviously, there's some campy bad acting here which you'd expect because the setting and situation is often so goofy. However, this is still a movie where things like this get said. I nuts, I cosmically my pants. Look, I'm not saying you can't curse in an X-Men movie. Go f yourself. I'm saying you shouldn't be cursing like that in something this silly. And you should especially not use racial slurs in something like this. Which, yes, they actually did. What? This movie feels like it has an identity crisis, and doesn't really know what audience it's trying to go for. It's too childish for adult fans, and it's too adult for children. There's also a bunch of scenes that are just, uh, oof, rough to watch. And for lack of a better word, let's go with, um, icky. Especially when the movie goes out of its way to tell you the age of all these characters. Look, I can excuse some of this because A, it was the 90s, and outrageousness was the name of the game. And B, because when you're younger, you want to be seen as more adult. And you would probably make stupid comments like this. I can uh, melt glass and see through pantyhose. Ooh, change those. Can't see through your clothes. Damn, nice beaver. You snuck a feel when you pulled her off me? Well, uh, maybe a quick one. But the sheer volume of this unpleasantness and focus on this kind of vocabulary feels incredibly out of place in an X-Men story. On top of that, it just feels extra wrong when the adult supervision these teens have are getting in on the action too. And we're supposed to relax and concentrate at the same time. Make believe you're playing with yourself, Kurt. <laughs> I can make that girl pat a butter in your... <laughs> Nobody knows I'm out here except you believe. Mutie cutie. What do you want from me? It's not what you think, honey. I love you for your mind. And that is an awesome female. You can How about I? I'm this sweet little sister of yours. Ah, ah, oh god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh! Come on, guys, what are we doing here? This goes beyond bad taste. Who signed off on this, and who signs off on their paychecks? I want names. Aside from some very, very questionable material, there are some things about this movie that I just question. I don't know if they thought they were being clever and just had a really low bar for creative genius, but having the X-Men arcade game in the back of the shot in an X-Men movie 
just feels really dumb and really out of place. Mutants aren't thought fondly of in society. Most people either live in hatred or fear of them, or some kind of blend of both. These are very blatantly anti-mutant times, so there's no excuse to have them being marketed as a brand in the background of the shot. I'm sorry, even if this was meant as a meta wink and nod, it's coming at the expense of the narrative. There's a time and a place for this kind of thing. Now, if this exact thing happened in a Deadpool movie, no complaints. That's within the realm of that reality. But here? I don't know, it doesn't really make too much sense. Same when someone shows up wearing a Wolverine shirt. I just feel the movie patting itself on the back for making these references. When in actuality, it should be patting itself on the back of its head with a brick. Generation X just... It just wasn't it. All I can say is that there is a reason this movie doesn't get discussed. It's a really embarrassing point in X-Men history that honestly might be better off forgotten. How anyone thought this would be successful is far beyond me. This was a chore to sit through and try to make sense of. And even in my best efforts, I I'm not sure that we even accomplished that today. Nonetheless, that was the first ever X-Men movie. So if you liked this video as much as I didn't like that movie, and you would be interested in seeing me tackle more X-Men content here on the channel, let me know in the comment section below by leaving a comment saying, You went to X-Men school too? I am vengeance. I am the knight, and that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.